and Dick Garst. We're also pleased to have three of the four students here tonight who are receiving the prestigious Hendrickson Scholarship in Political Science and Honors. Please help me to congratulate Emily Toms, Warren Bisker, and Timothy Morgan. We recognize their exceptional academic achievement and we wish them well on their studies. Our other recipient is Jessica Johnson, who wasn't able to be here with us tonight. She's actually out of state. Uh, she's serving this semester as an intern uh, for Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth, uh, so a fantastic opportunity for her. Please consult your program to find biographies of all of our honorees, Dr. J.P. Hendrickson and Dean Herbert Cheever, and also Dr. Christy Garsantos, who will deliver our lecture tonight. This lecture was created to elevate our understanding of and appreciation for the value of a liberal education. One reason why the liberal arts are so enriching is that they allow us to join a conversation that has literally been in progress for thousands of years. We have the opportunity to engage with some of history's greatest thinkers. We can learn from them, draw inspiration from them, and even wrestle fiercely against some of them. Regardless, we grow as people by listening to and responding to those voices from the past. We become better versions of ourselves by participating in this conversation. We live in a society that tends to glamorize what's new and fashionable while often disregarding what we see as old, stodgy, or outdated. Honestly, I'm probably guilty of that myself. But a solid foundation of the liberal arts teaches us that wisdom and an understanding of the human experience have no expiration date. Neither Sophocles, nor Shakespeare, nor Cervantes ever imagined the technology that we enjoy today, but their timeless insights remain as relevant as ever. This lecture series serves as an annual celebration of how the liberal arts continue to inform our society. For the students in the audience, and there are many of you here tonight, I want you to know that my faculty colleagues and I are all committed to your success. Our goal for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences is that every one of you will receive a rigorous and rewarding education. An education that allows you to follow your passions, engage in discovery and creativity, and that prepares you to choose professional and personal opportunities that will enrich your lives and those of others. But I also want you to reflect on the conversation that you have now joined. Your education does not end when you cross the stage in Frost Arena and shake President Dunn's hand. That conversation continues, and you should keep participating in it through your entire life. I'm proud to work alongside colleagues like Dr. Garsantos, who follow in the footsteps of Dr. Cheever and Dr. Hendrickson, who model lifelong learning and a lifetime commitment to truth and humane values. I hope you do the same. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Garsantos. Six years ago, during the inaugural event, we presented plaques to both the Hendrickson family and to Dr. Cheever. We also have a special plaque posted in the lobby of the main office of the college. This plaque recognizes the Hendrickson Scholar with a new name added each year. Now it's time for the Cheever Lecture. At the end of this lecture, we should have time for questions from the audience. To commemorate this special event, we commission a medallion to be presented each year to the faculty member who delivers the lecture. I've asked Dr. Nicole Flynn, Associate Professor of English and Chair of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences Faculty Council to introduce our honored speaker and to present the medallion. Dr. Flynn. and pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. A first-generation college student, Dr. Garsantos began her higher education at Colorado State University. After she earned her Bachelor of Arts in Spanish, 
She went on to earn a master's degree in foreign languages, literature, and cultures, as well as a certification in Chicano studies from the Center for Applied Studies in American Ethnicity. She completed her graduate work at the University of Iowa, where she was awarded her PhD in Spanish literature. As soon as she arrived at SDSU, Dr. Gauss Santos began weaving her threads into the intellectual fabric of the college, the university, and the Brookings community. She is a living example of what the Hendrickson Award and Cheever Lecture seeks to promote, the importance of a liberal arts education in an ever-changing world. Her service record demonstrates her commitment to being an activist scholar. To name only a few, she has served on the Task Force for Diversity and Inclusion on campus, on the Board of Directors for the Brookings Domestic Abuse Shelter, and as faculty advisor for the Campus Women's Coalition, for which she received the Board of Regents Award for Organizational Leadership. Two years ago, she started what I consider one of her most impressive ventures, the CARA Pro Bono Alternative Spring Break Program. This program sends students from SDSU to a family detention center on the Texas-Mexico border to provide translation services to women and children seeking asylum in the U.S. No matter the club, committee, or organization, she willingly volunteers her considerable talents to enhance the lives of others, modeling the kind of citizenship that she promotes in her classes and in her research. In the classroom, she is an admired and beloved teacher, mentor, and role model. She has received numerous awards for teaching during her tenure at SDSU including the Faculty Award for Global Engagement and the prestigious Edward Patrick Hogan Award for Teaching. Because I have had the privilege of co-teaching with Dr. Gar Santos, I have witnessed firsthand her commitment to providing students the tools they need to navigate a world full of diverse and complex texts. I can also attest that her students value and deploy the skills they develop in her class and maintain their devotion to her long after graduation. While grabbing lunch after a protest in Sioux Falls this past summer, our table was approached not once, not twice, but by three students <laughs> eager to greet their former professor and share the exciting career and life experiences that they directly attributed to the instruction and mentorship they received from Dr. Gar Santos. But some of her most important and impressive work is her scholarship. And as a fellow literary scholar, I am excited for you to get a peek at what research in the humanities looks like and the power it has to reflect and affect our culture. Dr. Garcanto's impressive publication record in some of the most important journals in her field speaks to the relevance of her scholarship. She is a recognized expert on golden age Spanish literature and drama, and in particular, on the novel Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. In fact, the day after tomorrow, she is going to present another paper at an international Cervantes conference. Her work deftly examines literary texts, often alongside historical documents of the time, such as conduct manuals and legal statutes, in order to explore concepts of identity, gender, migration, xenophobia, and ethics. Topics that I think we can all agree are as timely today as they were in 17th century Spain. Indeed, her current work, a manuscript entitled The World Turned Upside Down, Cervantes and Pop Culture, connects the Quixote to contemporary trends and topics. And yes, fellow fans, this is a Hamilton reference. <laughs> In sum, you are about to hear from a scholar whose intelligence and innovation, eloquence and enthusiasm, compassion and conviction enrich the lives of her community members, her students, and her colleagues. On behalf of the Faculty Council for the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, 
please help me in welcoming to the podium my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Dr. Christy Garsatos. Thank you to the Hendrickson and Cheever families for supporting this very important award and visibility event um, for the liberal arts. I'd like to thank my parents for making the eight hour drive over from Wyoming. Um, and I would also like to thank Joe and my writing group who have heard various versions of this talk um, and have given me great feedback and encouraged me to continue with this line of research. So, without further ado, I'm going to grab my... <laughs> my clicker, all right. So I have divided this evening's lecture into three sections. To begin, I will address the importance of the liberal arts and the centrality of literature in our quest to understand the complexities of human lives. I will then move on to the heart of tonight's address, in which I use Miguel de Cervantes's 17th century masterpiece, Don Quixote de la Mancha, to provide a comparative analysis of 21st century sexual violence cases. Finally, I will conclude our time together this evening by linking this analysis back to literature's centrality in a liberal arts education, summarizing how Cervantes's work helps us understand our own world and our own moment with a little more clarity. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the quirky, skinny, middle-aged knight errant who is the protagonist of Cervantes' novel. And maybe you even know of his plump and comic squire, Sancho Panza. Others may have read the famous and ubiquitous windmill scene. And with that information in mind, you may be wondering when, where, and how sexual assault comes up in the novel. But what you may not be aware of, if you haven't read the novel, is that the book that we know today as the Quixote was actually written in two parts, and both parts are entertainingly episodic. Like any good television series, we have the main plot, which develops as we follow the main character around in his daily life, and we have several very interesting subplots as we meet and interact with Don Quixote's friends, family, and acquaintances along the way. The episode that I'm going to analyze here this evening is known as the Dorotea Don Fernando story, and it is one of the longest running episodes or subplots in the novel, spanning 19 chapters of the first part. So, armed with this background information, let's begin with our first question, why the liberal arts? First, it might be helpful to remember that the term ars liberalis, or the liberal arts, refers to the subjects and skills that the ancient Greeks and Romans considered essential knowledge for a free person. Indeed, liberalis is Latin for worthy of a free person. And we see this Latin root in English words like liberty and liberation. The term conveys that the knowledge and skills taught in these academic subjects prepare students to actively participate in civic life and to be productive, well-informed citizens, meaning that they can participate in public debate, serve on juries, cast informed votes, run for office, and generally understand and interact in the complex societies in which we have always lived and worked. And yet, one of the most pressing challenges we now face in higher education is the need to defend the foundational status of the liberal arts. And many, as many increasingly view universities as training grounds for a specific career path, we currently find ourselves trying to convince university administrators, regents, politicians, parents, and students that a course in philosophy, history, or literature is just as worthy of investment as a course in nursing or engineering. And although this trend is cause for alarm for those of us who believe that the liberal arts are critical to the civic and personal well-being of our democracy, 
It has, for this very reason, pushed us to articulate and overtly defend the critical skills that we teach. In my particular field of 17th century Spanish literature, a fellow Cervantes scholar, David Castillo, puts the question this way. How do we explain our dedication to commentary on texts written centuries ago, often in foreign languages, even as our students struggle to keep up with the massive amounts of information made available daily by increasingly powerful digital technology networks? What kind of real life lessons or skills might literature classes offer our students? The lecture that I am delivering here tonight is my attempt to answer these imperative questions. It is a demonstration of how the liberal arts connect academic learning to contemporary social problems and issues. And in the case of literary studies in particular, how they teach us to engage in cultural commentary. As Luis Martinez Dudillo and Nicholas Spadaccini argue, the study of literature or the training of students in conscious alert readings of texts as opposed to facile consumption contributes to the education of students who function in societies that are increasingly saturated with messages, training them to become discerning readers of the world around them. And a discerning reader, that is, an alert and educated reader, becomes an active participant in the production of meaning, rather than merely a passive recipient of messages that seek to shape the reader's reality and identity. In short, the role of literature lies at the very heart of a liberal arts education. If the liberal arts are the collective subjects necessary for free men and women, then we cannot overstate the importance of reading and interpretation as a liberating activity. Reading, as we define it and teach it, requires analytical interpretation. It is a practice that engages with and questions the narratives that shape our cultures, our societies, and our lives. Specifically, Cervantes' work is deeply concerned with the acts of reading and writing and with how writers and readers participate in the production and consumption of cultural narratives. Therefore, his work provides us with a perfect laboratory in which to explore past and present sociocultural issues, issues such as immigration, the place of Muslims in a Christian nation, and of interest to us here this evening, institutionalized gender norms and sexual violence. Far from simply reflecting these issues in his work, Cervantes openly invites us to question who gets to speak, who gets to tell their story, and how that story is typically represented in the media of the day. Cervantes lived through a series of profound social and economic crises, such as national bankruptcies, rampant inflation, a decreasing population, plague, religious conflicts, and political uprisings from various corners of the Spanish Empire. At the time, the novel as we know it did not exist. No one had ever written a story about an average everyday citizen, or about peasant women, or Muslim Christian converts in the heartland. But Cervantes invents a new social media and uses his writing to critique the institutionalized behaviors, beliefs, and practices that he believed were contributing to Spain's decline. I argue here that his writing can help us to better understand and utilize contemporary social media movements as we work to critique our own institutionalized behaviors, beliefs, and practices that are contributing to the twin challenges of rape culture and sexual violence. Very briefly, I want to address my transnational, transhistorical method of textual commentary. My analysis is not a dehistoricization of Cervantes or the Quixote. Rather, following relatively recent work in Cervantes studies, my reading is a strategic rehistoricization of classic literature, a reading that addresses what German philosopher Walter Benjamin calls the state of emergency in which we live. This rehistoricization takes into account the historical, social, and cultural context of the novel, that is, the material conditions in which it was written, and then reads those contexts against and alongside our own. In other words, it dislodges Cervantes from the dusty pedestal of high culture and returns him and his writing to their own historical state of emergency. By reading Don Quixote alongside contemporary cases of sexual violence, we discover trans-historical bridges between past and present and recover the historical urgency, both then and now, of examining the codes we use to represent and understand our worlds. So let's turn now to the fictional cases of Don Quixote and to the heart of my talk, 
Rape culture is when 17th century Spanish literature speaks to our Me Too moment. On March 20th of 2014, Time published an opinion piece by Carolyn Kitchens claiming that rape culture does not Using the hashtag rape culture is when, a million people schooled their fellow Americans on how to identify rape culture with tweets like, rape culture is when the media mourns the end of Steubenville rapists' football careers. Roughly two years later, social media was once again outraged by the mainstream media and the judge's handling of the Brock Turner case, the Stanford rapist whose swimming career ended when he was found guilty of three counts of felony sexual assault. During the sentencing phase of the trial, the victim, identified as Emily Doe, read aloud her powerful 7,000-word victim impact statement. The New York Times described the statement as a cri de coeur, or heartfelt cry, against the role of privilege in the trial and the way the legal system deals with sexual assault. The following day, BuzzFeed published Doe's full statement, which rapidly went viral, garnering over 8 million views in three days driven by widespread sharing on social media. More recently, the hashtags Time's Up and Me Too have driven solidarity movements from Hollywood to Washington, D.C. in an effort to begin a public conversation about sexual violence and to mobilize change. The social media storms created by these viral hashtags and victims' testimonies leave no doubt that rape culture exists in 21st century America and that we need more creative and effective ways to talk about how our social institutions and cultural practices normalize, mask, and even excuse sexual violence. Tonight, we will engage the liberal arts and literature in particular to inform our conversation, comparing selected representations of rape in Don Quixote to the statements and newspaper articles that have come out of the Brock Turner case, as well as the ongoing cases against powerful men like Harvey Weinstein. My goal is not to compare what happens, that is, the actual sexual assaults, but rather how we talk about what happens, how we talk about and represent rape in our everyday lives. I am not suggesting a literal correlation between Cervantes' novel and contemporary US rape categories. Instead, my goal is to use these texts to enhance our current understanding of rape and thereby to contribute to the urgent task of dismantling rape culture and diminishing the occurrence of sexual violence in all its forms. I show that by putting Cervantes' notoriously ambiguous or even ambivalent texts in conversation with contemporary representations of rape, we can deepen our understanding of the socio-political, historical, and cultural connections between rape culture, sexual violence, and privilege. Let's turn now to the Dorotea and Don Fernando story, which is found in part one of Don Quixote. We first meet Dorotea after her sexual assault, sitting alone by a mountain stream disguised as a male shepherd. Along with Don Quixote's friends, we discover that Dorotea has fled to the mountains in search of safety after, ser after a series of traumatic encounters with men. Tellingly, Dorotea does not start her tale the evening of her rape, but rather spends several pages establishing herself as a good girl and describing her life prior to Don Fernando as wholesome, pure, and productive. The issue of productivity is more important than it may at first seem, as it was a major point of contention between the socioeconomic reformers and the traditionalists of 16th century Spain. The reformers, on the one hand, wanted the Spanish nobility to work, and they wanted to redefine work as an honorable and noble activity. The traditionalists, on the other hand, were quite happy with the status quo, which held that only the nobility had honor and that those who had to work were not noble and should not have access to the privileges of the nobility. <coughs> Thus, in the Dorotea and Don Fernando story, Cervantes also tells a tale of privilege and social inequality. Don Fernando is of noble blood. He is the son of a duke with a title, lots of land, and the privileges that nobility brings. Dorotea is a farmer's daughter. She and her parents are peasants. They work the land as vassals or tenants of Don Fernando's family. Dorotea makes sure to explain to Don Quixote's friends that she follows all the rules. She reads devotional books approved by the church. She respects her parents and oversees all of the operations of their family farm. She dresses modestly and never goes out uncovered. Indeed, the only time she leaves the house is to go to mass. 
However, despite all of these efforts, Don Fernando sees her, crushes hard, becoming obsessed by her beauty, and begins to very publicly pursue her. He writes her letters, buys her gifts, and bribes her chambermaid to give them to her. He camps out in her street at night, singing love songs and reciting poetry. Dorotea consistently blows him off, telling him that she is not interested, that this is a ridiculous idea given their unequal social status, and that she has no time for his outrageous antics. In 21st century terms, Fernando is a total player. He's a rich playboy who doesn't have to work, has nothing but time and money on his hands, and uses both to manipulate those around him for his own ends. Dorotea's parents are rightfully concerned with the commotion that Don Fernando is causing, especially because, generally speaking, in 17th century Spain, the only way that women had honor was through their chastity, and if their chastity was lost or even placed in doubt, so was their honor. And Don Fernando was calling into serious doubt Dorotea's chastity with his very public overtures. Seeking to maintain Dorotea's good name, her parents, with Dorotea's consent, start looking for a suitor from her own class. When, Dorotea hear, when Don Fernando hears of her parents' plan, he decides that he has to act now if he is going to get what he wants. So he once again bribes Dorotea's chambermaid to let him into Dorotea's room that night. Dressed in only her bedclothes, Dorotea is suddenly face to face with her suitor stalker. He physically constrains her, holding her motionless, intent on having sex with her by whatever means necessary. Dorotea finds herself in a no-win situation, knowing that if she screams and causes a public ruckus, people will never believe that she is blameless, and also that Fernando, despite his proclamations of love, is only there for one thing. She struggles, she refuses, and she pleads swearing that she would rather die than have sex with someone out of wedlock. In the end, she tries to salvage the situation as best she can by convincing him to sign a marriage vow before they have sex. He does, they have sex, but consent, now and in this novel, is a vexed issue. The first and most important difficulty we face in talking about and representing rape is that we cannot even agree on what rape is or what rape looks like. This is especially true in cases of acquaintance rape, which is also referred to as date rape. The Dorotea and Don Fernando story in part one of Don Quixote offers readers a perfect example of this difficulty, leaving it up to us to decide exactly what takes place in Dorotea's room that night and whom we deem culpable and why. In a study of acquaintance rape, Suzanne Schultz notes that there is ongoing confusion about sexual violence when the attacker and the one attacked know each other when a woman is not physically harmed during or after the act of sexual violation, or when the rapist enjoys communal recognition. The novel encourages readers to ask the types of questions Schultz lays out in her study. Questions such as, how do we define sexual consent? When do we identify a man as a rapist? What are our standards for real rape? And where do those standards come from? If we read Dorotea's tale through the lens of acquaintance rape, we recognize many of the characteristics that today we would call rape culture. Cervantes is famous for making the reader work to understand a story, often offering multiple points of view and even conflicting information. Here, he paints the Dorotea Don Fernando tale in all its messy humanity. For example, although Dorotea is consistent in her refusal of Fernando, she admits to Don Quixote's friends that she was initially pleased by Fernando's flattery and very public attention. She acknowledges that she was aware of the social advantages his proposal would bring, and on the night he forced his way into her room, we find out that she did verbally acquiesce to his demand for sex after lucidly evaluating what she had to gain if she continued to resist. These very realistic details have divided critics leaving many to question the sincerity of Dorotea's protests, while others insist that she only consents under duress. Additionally, the honest and quite human portrayal of female desire has opened Dorotea to victim blaming and numerous accusations of gold digging. After all, this line of reasoning goes, she did find Fernando in his initial overtures attractive, so she must have wanted it. As Schultz observes, when it comes to rape, Many people still believe that the woman should have resisted more. 
To those who think this way, the very presence of sexual intercourse proves that the woman was willing and as a result is untrustworthy in her allegations. However, for those of us working against rape culture, consent to one action is not consent to every action, and consent is only consent if it is freely given without the threat of physical violence, verbal manipulation, or even the pressure of social or cultural consequences, such as the loss of honor, social status, or career advancement. I hope that at this point, many of you are hearing echoes of contemporary sexual violence cases. For example, in the cases against Harvey Weinstein, the question of consent has come up time and again. And we've, seen, we've also seen many example, examples of victim blaming and charges of gold digging. I've heard people on TV, as well as in casual conversations, say things like, well, they're actresses. What did they think they were going to have to do to make it? Or what did they think was going to happen to them when they went to his room? I argue that this is the same gendered idea that we see in the 1605 Quixote, when Dorotea feels the need to defend her chastity and good name before even telling her story. In our cultural narratives surrounding gender, the absence of sex has long been seen as the woman's responsibility, and the presence of any sexual activity has been understood as evidence of consent. Furthermore, certain women have always been seen as untrustworthy in their allegations of sexual assault, or even, quite frankly, as deserving what they got. Historically, these have been women who cross the private-public divide, women who by choice or by necessity leave the domestic sphere and enter the public realm. In 1605, Dorotea certainly falls into this category as a farm girl who works outside the home, <coughs> and as a female peasant who leaves the domestic space disguised as a male shepherd to go after the, a duke whom she says jilted her. Historically, actresses have also fallen into this category because they also cross that private public line, living other lives and publicly displaying themselves on screen. Harvey Weinstein certainly revealed this attitude when responding to Ronan Farrow's October 2017 New Yorker article. When asked to respond to the allegations detailed in that piece, he issued a blanket statement through a spokesperson that read, any allegations of non-consensual sex are unequivocally denied by Mr. Weinstein. Mr. Weinstein obviously can't speak to anonymous allegations, but with respect to any women who have made allegations on the record, Mr. Weinstein believes that all of these relationships were consensual. Although Weinstein and his representatives insist that the incidents were consensual, the women interviewed in Farrow's article tell a very different story. Lucia Evans, who had aspirations of becoming an actress, met Weinstein the summer between her junior and senior year of college. Speaking of her assault, she recounts, I said over and over, I don't want to do this, stop, don't. I tried to get away, but maybe I didn't try hard enough. I didn't want to kick him or fight him. He's a big guy. In the end, however, he overpowered her. As we see here and in the fictional Dorotea account, a further complicating factor in cases of acquaintance rape is that it is not unusual for the woman herself to be confused about the nature of sexual intercourse. This is true for Lucia Evans. She goes on to say, I just sort of gave up. That's the most horrible part of it. And that's why he's been able to do this for so long and to so many women. People give up and then they feel like it's their fault. Another woman who was too afraid to use her name in Pharaoh's article tells an eerily similar story. She recounts that she went with Weinstein to a hotel room under a professional pretext. And although she told him no repeatedly and clearly, he forced himself on her sexually. Afterward, she reports feeling both horror and shame and she ultimately decided not to go to the police, thinking it would be a he said, she said argument. She adds, I thought about how impressive his legal team is, and I thought about how much I would lose, and I decided to just move forward. Pharaoh concludes her story with a very telling indicator of rape culture and privilege, writing, the woman continued to have professional contact with Weinstein after the alleged rape, and acknowledged that subsequent communications between them might suggest a normal working relationship. She told Pharaoh, I was in a vulnerable position and I needed my job. It just increases. 
the shame, and the guilt. And yet, contemporary readers of the Quixote are consistently judgmental of Dorotea's post-assault behavior. But as we see in these 2018 cases, necessity can lead to continued contact, and feelings of guilt and shame often lead people to not report the assault. But moreover, to not classify what happened to them as assault. In fact, if we take a closer look at the Quixote, we see that Dorotea does not refer to the events of that evening as rape, opting instead to speak of their desposorio, which is the Spanish equivalent of a betrothal or engagement. However, this is where our training and conscious alert reading comes into play. Dorotea tells Don Quixote's friends about two subsequent rape attempts, one by a servant who helps her track down Fernando, and another by a mule driver. If we compare her descriptions of all three assaults, Fernando, the servant, and the mule driver, we see instructive parallels that reveal some of the beliefs that uphold rape culture. Dorotea has no problem identifying the latter interactions as rape when she describes her post-Fernando troubles. However, upon close textual analysis, Dorotea uses the same legally loaded 17th century expression, usar de la fuerza, or to use force, to refer to all three events. As she weighs her options with Don Fernando, Dorotea reasons. If I am not doing anything that has not been done before, it is a good idea to accept the honor that fate offers me, even if the love he shows me lasts no longer than the satisfaction of his desire. For after all, in the sight of God, I shall be his wife. And if I try to reject him with disdain, I can see that if he does not achieve his ends in the proper way, he will use force, and I shall be dishonored and have no excuse when I am blamed by those who do not know how blamelessly I find myself in this situation. In this passage, we see parallels as to how rape culture trains us to excuse or even condone rape when the rapist is known, when he is an upstanding or respected citizen, and when the victim conditionally consents to avoid further physical or psychic harm. When Dorotea later recounts the evening to Don Quixote's friends, like the woman in the Weinstein case, she is unsure of exactly what took place, stating, when he took his leave, he removed a magnificent ring from his finger and put it on mine. Then he left, and I do not know if I was sad or happy. I can say that I was confused and pensive and almost out of my mind. However, in her account of the ensuing assaults, her confusion is gone, and she does not hesitate to define these events as rape. Gone are the confounding references to Fernando's love or the honor such a match would bring, both of which function to soften and obfuscate the assault. In the case of her servant and traveling companion, Dorotea recounts, my good servant, faithful and trustworthy until then, saw me in this desolate place, and inflamed by his own depravity, attempted to take advantage of the opportunity which, to his mind, this setting offered him. With little shame and less fear of God or respect for me, he tried to persuade me to make love to him, and seeing that I responded with words of censure and rebuke to his outrageous proposals, he set aside the entreaties and began to use force. In self-defense, Dorotea pushes her attacker over a cliff and doesn't even feel compelled to determine whether she left him dead or alive. When her muleteer boss has the same evil desire, she no longer wishes to test her love with men and opts instead to take her chances alone in the wilderness, which is when we find her sitting alone by the mountain stream. Tellingly, Dorotea has no problem identifying these last two sexual assaults as criminal and depraved, and neither do the literary critics who have written about her story. Contrary to what has been said of Don Fernando, no critic, to my knowledge, has ever referred to Dorotea's servant, or the mule driver, as a lover, or as an essentially honorable man who just needs a good woman to redeem him from his baser instincts, both of which have been written about her noble date rapist by 20th century literary critics. And this leads us to the question of whom, we ident whom do we identify as a rapist, and what do we consider real rape? Both Dorotea and some critics are hesitant to call Don Fernando a rapist, or to identify their encounter as a form of rape, because he is a nobleman, the son of a grandee, and therefore an ideal man according to dominant discursive norms. 
And really, as we know, boys will be boys and girls should know better. Fernando courted her, he gave her gifts, she accepted them and liked them, and liked the attention, and in the end, can't we all just admit that he made a mistake, but he then lives up to her, his word and marries her? In Fernando's own words, perhaps it was ordained by heaven so that I, seeing the fidelity of your love for me, would esteem you as you deserve to be esteemed. What I ask is that you not reprimand my poor behavior and great negligence. For the same hot-headed behavior that moved me to take you as my own also impelled me to avoid being yours. In other words, you can't blame me for my behavior. That's just the way we privileged noblemen are. Again, hearing the details of this story should sound familiar to us because they read like so many of the recent rape cases to hit social media, including the Brock Turner and Harvey Weinstein cases, which is what I'd like to turn to now. Keeping in mind Fernando's I'm just a product of my privileged noble environment statement, I'd like to compare it briefly to Weinstein's changing statements and then to Brock Turner's trial statement in more detail. In the Times piece, Weinstein made an initial effort at damage control by partly acknowledging what he had done, saying, I appreciate the way I've behaved with colleagues in the past has caused a lot of pain, and I sincerely apologize for it. However, as the allegations added up, he later changed his approach. In an interview with the New York Post, he blamed his behavior on a stereotypically male temper, stating, I've got to deal with my personality. I've got to work on my temper. I have got to dig deep. I know a lot of people would like me to go into a facility, and I may well just do that. I will go anywhere I can learn more about myself. This time, his only reference to the sexual assaults was, in the past, I used to compliment people, and some took it as me being sexual. I won't do that again. His publicist added, Mr. Weinstein has begun counseling, has listened to the community, and is pursuing a better path. Mr. Weinstein is hoping that, if he makes enough progress, he will be given a second chance. Note that both here and in the fictional Fernando case, both men excuse their behavior by suggesting that just, this is just what men like them do. They also grossly underestimate the severity of their behavior, with Fernando speaking of his failure to demonstrate his true love for Dorotea, and Weinstein referring to his misunderstood compliments. Furthermore, both men ask, and even assume, that their behavior will be forgiven, and they will be given a second chance. To conclude our time together tonight, I'd like to analyze one last case. We'll return to the Brock Turner case and read Turner's statement, which he wrote to the judge after the guilty verdict and during the sentencing phase of the trial. Turner's statement has many of the same elements of those made above by the fictional Don Fernando and historical Harvey Weinstein. I think it's important to point out that Turner was found guilty and convicted on three counts of felony sexual assault. Assault with intent to rape an intoxicated woman, sexually penetrating an intoxicated person with a foreign object, and sexually penetrating an unconscious person with a foreign object. The recommended minimum sentence was five years in prison. This was part of Turner's statement as he asked for leniency. When I came to school in California, I began to champion the idea of relieving the stress of school and swimming by consuming alcohol on weekends. I carelessly thought that this was at the core essentials of a college lifestyle. I remember attending social gatherings with the swim team where partying, drinking, and hooking up were not only accepted, but almost encouraged. I saw the guys take full advantage of these circumstances. I just accepted these things that they showed me as normal. I know that if I were to be placed on probation, I would be able to be a benefit to society for the rest of my life. I want to show that people's lives can be destroyed by drinking and making poor decisions. One needs to recognize the influence that peer pressure and the attitude of having to fit in can have on someone. I know I can impact and change people's attitudes towards the culture surrounded by binge drinking and sexual promiscuity. Throughout Turner's statement, not once does he acknowledge the severity of his crimes or the sexual assault, insisting that the young woman had consented. The only thing he claims responsibility for is giving into peer pressure and drinking. Furthermore, 
his reference to sexual promiscuity comes dangerously close to victim blaming. Indeed, many of the testimonials that were sent to the judge in support of Turner during the sentencing phase downplayed his crimes, blamed the victim for being assaulted, and lamented the consequences the Stanford All-Star swimmer was facing as a result. His father, for example, astonishingly complained, his life will never be the one he dreamed about and worked so hard to achieve. That is a steep price to pay for 20 minutes of action. That's it. The disturbing sexual assault of an unconscious young woman whom his son stripped behind a dumpster was just 20 minutes of action. And it was not just family members. Perhaps the most revealing statement of a rape culture came from Turner's friend Leslie Rasmussen, whose letter the judge actually cited as a strong character reference. She writes, I don't think it's fair to base the fate of the next 10 plus years of his life on the decision of a girl who doesn't remember anything but the amount she drank to press charges against him. I am not blaming her directly for this, because that isn't right. But where do we draw the line and stop worrying about being politically correct every second of the day and see that rape on campuses isn't always because people are rapists. It is because these universities encourage drinking. I am so sick of hearing that these young men are monsters when really you are throwing barely 20-somethings into this camp-like university environment, supporting partying, and then your mind is blown when things get out of hand. This is completely different from a woman getting kidnapped and raped as she is walking to her car in a parking lot. That is a rapist. These are not rapists. These are idiot boys and girls having too much to drink and not being aware of their surroundings and having clouded judgment. And this, I argue, is precisely the problem. In our cultural representations of rape, you can't be a rapist if you are a college student, if you are rich, if you are noble, if you are an athlete, if you are a son or a brother or a friend. Rapists are lower class monsters who live in the margins of our society, kidnapping and raping unknown women in liminal spaces. We all have been taught this, and the judge clearly believed this when he delivered a sentence of six months in a county jail. Turner served three months. So here is where I agree and disagree with Ms. Rasmussen. These men are not monsters, but they are rapists. This is what Cervantes and the skills learned from literary study can help us to understand. This is what the hashtag movements of rape culture is when and me too are trying to reveal. We need a new cultural narrative that breaks the link between monstrosity and rape. We need a new cultural narrative that recognizes that these men and their behavior, which ranges from discrimination to harassment to outright violence, along with our responses to them, are the logical outcome of our institutionalized practices and beliefs surrounding gender norms and social privilege. As David Roberts wrote this month in Vox, of course harassment and abuse exist along a spectrum. The point is not that everything on the spectrum is the same, but that it's all the same spectrum. A range of expressions that trace to a core set of ideas, namely that women are objects, adjuncts to men, there to soothe, coddle, please, and serve men, subject to their control and abuse. For centuries, our language and cultural narratives have protected certain men, ensuring that they will never be labeled as rapists. Famous athletes, movie moguls, and other authorities have a privilege that protects them from social judgment. Women, however, have never been protected from social judgment. In fact, when they decide to come forward, they are often blamed for their own assault, or worse yet, seen as the perpetrator of the real crime, which is an end to her assaulter's career. In both the fictional Fernando case and the historical Turner and Weinstein cases, we see a social reluctance to label powerful or ideal men rapists. Their privileged social standing protects them. The issue at hand is not a matter of better legislation or more equal access to citizenship for women. Both in 1605 and 2018, the issue is a problem of representation, and literature can help play a major role in addressing the problem. Cervantes' ironic and ambivalent representations of rape function much like Twitter today, using a new and improbable genre to reveal the cultural benefit, the cultural beliefs 
entitlement, and privilege that maintain rape culture. Okay, we've got time for questions. Uh, we do have two um, uh, faculty representatives, uh, Dr. Elena Jones and Dr. Josh uh, Westwick, uh, out with microphones. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, they'll get to you. Uh, and with the mic, uh, we'll be able to hear your question and uh, you'll be able to hear uh, Dr. Garcantos answer. perspectives because we hear from both Dorotea and from Don Fernando um, and we also hear from many of their friends before we ever actually meet the two characters um, and Don Fernando is definitely not the good guy and the additional sort of revealing factor is that social inequality um, Dorotea is definitely billed not only as the not only as the woman who will redeem Don Fernando, but as the peasant who will redeem Spanish society. They were suffering from major bankruptcy, inflation, economic crisis at the time. And so there's definitely this narrative that it is the peasant, the working class, that is going to save Spain from these ills. And that Don Fernando's rape of Dorotea is just a metaphorical rape of the nobles' rape of Spain. If the novel had hardly been done or thought of before, how do you think uh, he came up with such a subtle and uh, lasting uh, work of art that still is read today? What made, his, what made him so creative? <laughs> <laughs> that is the million dollar question, right? Um, I mean, I think there are a number of, of things that fed into his creativity. Um, one is that he was a frustrated war veteran when he returned home from Spain after five years of captivity in Algiers. Um, he definitely had a different perspective of his homeland. Um, gosh, I don't know <laughs> where, where, where else to go with that. He, um, he was a frustrated dramatist. He, he wanted to actually write theater, but Lope de Vega was already doing that and doing it very well. Um, and so he was definitely looking for, and, and Lope had invented, invented what was called a new theater. And so I think Cervantes was definitely looking for a new way to write. And he was also very frustrated with the existing genres of the time, which are what we would call like Harlequin romance novels, right? They were only these ideal knights and damsels in distress, and they didn't represent any of the real humanity that, that was going on in Spain at the time. So, I, I mean, it was a combination of all of those things, but it is certainly an endure, enduring work.
Hello. I am curious about your seed, the first seed of this connection that you make between these two seemingly unique things. Um, that was just serendipity, I guess. <laughs> At the time, I was, um, I was teaching the novel, um, and I was also publishing a paper, I was writing an article on, on Dorotea, when the Brock Turner um, news hit, hit, the, hit social media. And I just kept thinking, like, it's, it's this privilege, right? Like, there's, that, that's, that's this unifying theme. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about 1605 or 2016 at the time, 2014, I think it was. Um, and, and watching the, the tortured way that Dorotea talks about what happened to her, um, and knowing that she had no other choices, right? At the time in 1605, the only option for a woman um, in, her, in her state would have been to be locked away in a convent because she was damaged goods, or to marry her rapist. And in the end, that's what she does. But Cervantes makes it very clear that we shouldn't look at that as, as a good and celebrated thing, which is what the other characters in the novel do. Like, oh, isn't it wonderful? She convinced him to marry her, and so it's all okay now. And, and again, there was just this way that both she and the other characters were talking about Don Fernando's actions in a way that was clearly different from the other two rape scenes. And I just kept thinking, you know, when these rape cases of famous, athletes or movie moguls as we saw, right, or politicians, I mean, when these hit, hit social media, we talk about them differently than when we talk about other men, right? Um, especially if they're from a lower class or they don't have that privilege that will protect them. I have a two-part question. Um, the first part is, um, I like what you said about the novel being a brand new genre. And I, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about, you talk about social media generally, but Twitter is such an important part of your presentation. Um, is there anything you want to say about um, the way in which emergent genres are particularly adept at th this kind of cultural analysis. Um, I write about the novel too, but you know, when it's been around for 400, 500 years. Uh, so if you want to say anything about emergent genres, you're interested in that. And the second part is very simple. Do you want to say anything about Kavanaugh? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I've been wondering. I off of the stage without having to weigh in on that. That's why you don't invite friends and family. That's right. <laughs> Who brought him? <laughs> so, um, oh, I guess we're not plugged in. Okay, so first part, emergent genres. I mean, I think, as the, the question over here alluded to, I think they're amazingly pliable, um, and so they allow authors whether that is authors of tweets or authors of a novel, um, to speak to an audience in a way that they've never been spoken to before, right? And so I think that it has a little bit more impact. Um, and I think that's all I'll say about that right now. Um, as for Kavanaugh, so, I mean, I guess, Obviously, there are many things that we could say about the Kavanaugh case, but I would want to keep my comments relevant to tonight's lecture. And what I mean by that is that I would want to look at how we're talking about rape um, or attempted rape in the Kavanaugh case 
rather than, you know, did he do it, did he not do it? I mean, that's not anything that we can determine here tonight. Um, and in, in terms of how we have talked about the Kavanaugh case so far, I believe that it's a textbook example of what we would call rape culture. Since the story broke, the public is, are her accusations true and are they relevant, right? And so if we tackle and unpack that first um, line of public debate, are the accusations true, we see a classic charge of rape culture, right? That um, these are false accusations, the woman is fabricating the charges for personal reasons or because she's mentally unstable or hysterical or any number of, of things. And we know that in terms of false accusations, um, and I was prepared for the Kavanaugh question. Um, <laughs> So in terms of, of false accusations, they're incredibly rare, right? So if all of the light brown are, are rape cases, um, the slightly darker brown is reported, the dark brown up, up top is those who face trial, and the reddish pink are those who jailed. Down here in the, the corner, those are the falsely accused cases. So. Um, we know that statistically, false accusations make up about 2% of all accusations, and they're not any higher than the false accusations of any other crime. So statistically speaking, false accusations um, are not higher in, in cases of, of rape. Um, the other difficulty that I have with this line of reasoning is that this group keeps saying that Dr. Blasey has not produced any evidence, right? That it's a false accusation because there's no evidence. Um, completely overlooking the fact that she named a third person in the room and that the Senate Judiciary Committee has repeatedly said that they will not call Mark Judge to stand witness um, or to testify under oath. So again, if you're trying to determine whether this is a false accusation or not, that seems like a, one of the reasonable approaches to actually going about that. Um, and then in terms of the second line of debate, are they relevant? That to me is even more indicative of a rape culture and therefore more damaging in my opinion. And here I'm referring to all of the people who have denied the have not denied the possibility that it happened, but rather that even if it did, it shouldn't matter. Um, and these arguments follow the same lines of thought that we saw in my lecture, right? Namely, that boys will be boys, that these actions are somehow trivial, and that it was high school, and therefore um, that should not derail um, a career. But if we follow those conclusions to their log those thoughts to their logical conclusions, you know, what we're saying is, well, this will ruin his life or career, but we're not going to acknowledge how those actions already ruined hers. It was just a few stupid minutes, but those minutes changed all of her years since. He doesn't deserve this, assumes or implies that she does. And I think just the whole situation, you know, it, it just says that we're willing to sacrifice the lives of girls because future or present careers of boys matter more. Advantages we didn't talk about rape. If, if liberal education is as good as you suggest, do we need movements like Me Too in order to get us to address these sorts of issues? I think we do. Um, I mean, I think I think that's always been a role of 
of these medium, right? Whether it's the novel or whether it's the plastic arts, theater, I think Twitter is a form of that. Um, I think it is one of the only ways that we actually have public debate about some of these issues. Um, and that was certainly true of the novel at the time. Um, because a lot of people couldn't read, they, um, they would gather at events like this, at roadside inns or at the neighbor's house, and they would read the, the novels together. And then they would actually debate, well, what exactly went on there? What happened there? And because we no longer have that public space, or, or not in the same way, I think that is an attempt of, so, I think that's what social media is attempting. I think that is what Twitter or Instagram is trying to do, is, is open up that space of public debate again. How do you feel Me Too and movements like Time's Up do at addressing um, the intersectional issues of sexual assault? Um, well, I think, I think they are addressing the issues. Um, could they do better? Yes. I mean, Me Too is a prime example of that, right? I mean, Me Too was started in 2006 by an African-American woman named Tarana Burke. And it wasn't until Alyssa Milano tweeted it in October of 2017, so not even a year. I, we're coming up on a year, right? But that's when it exploded. And so again, I think that goes back to some of the issues I brought up in my lecture as well, which is these issues of privilege. I mean, questions of rape and rape culture have always been caught up in issues of privilege, right? I mean, not only is it we only consider certain men rapists, but we also only consider certain women, and quite frankly, certain humans, rapeable, right? I mean, um, we don't talk often about uh, male rape, right? I mean, so I think, I think there's a lot of potential there. I mean, do I think that it's, you know, where it needs to be? No. Um, I guess what I want to ask is, we're looking at um, a 17th century novel and we're seeing the rape culture there and it's 2018, so it's kind of like, it's kind of a downer when you look at it as an English student, this isn't the only place I've seen it. Um, so I guess I just want to know, you know, we just had Bill Cosby sentencing, we talked about Kavanaugh, of where are you seeing the progress? Have you seen it? Here. Um, I mean, I think we see the progress in forums like tonight. Mm -hmm. um, at the time when Cervantes was writing, I mean, there wasn't even a term for rape, right? I mean, these women were using usar de la fuerza or to use force, right? Um, and it was a legal term. Like, it did carry legal weight in a court if you could prove it but you also couldn't take nobles to court, so that was super problematic, right? Um, so, I mean, we've definitely made progress. I mean, we are seeing lots of high-profile men face a reckoning. Um, can it be depressing? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the title of the talk, right? Like, rape culture is when 17th century Spanish literature speaks to our 2018 Me Too moment. Um, so, I think progress is being made. Keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> Let's do one final question. Um, so, going kind of off of that question about the sentencing of like Bill Cosby and then um, the G U.S. like um, gymnastics doctor who got um, convicted a while ago, do you think that some of those were based more off of the convictions were based more off of chance or like the circumstances of the particular person? Because um, I know a lot of people have brought up that maybe Bill Cosby wouldn't actually have been sentenced if he was a white man, um, and he would have gotten away with it as well. Do you kind of see like? that is like a 
like so those convictions as like a circumstance or is that like a way we can like a glimmer of hope for maybe our society slowly working at maybe dismantling some of um, rape culture i'm an optimist and so i choose to look at them as a glimmer of hope um i think that with the hashtag activism I think we are starting to see, we're starting to see movement. movement. Um, I think it will be interesting to see what, if anything, happens in the Harvey Weinstein case. Um, I think it will be interesting to see what happens in the Kavanaugh case. Um, but women are certainly out and talking about these issues, as well as men, right? I mean, we can't forget our, our male allies in this fight, there are lots of people who are out and saying, this is it, right? We can't, we can't keep doing this. And Me Too has broken to the surface or in a way that I think other movements haven't to date. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think we have reason to be optimistic. Will there be setbacks? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Garsantos, for uh, sharing your thoughts on how a liberal arts education adds to our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. Uh, I especially commend you for uh, addressing what is clearly a high-profile and timely issue uh, with grace and civility. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of with this lecture uh, is the way that it serves as a model for what discourse among educated citizens ought to look like. Uh, I want to thank again, uh, close by thanking again uh, the Hendrickson and Cheever families uh, and their guests who joined us tonight. Uh, please join us for refreshments at the front of the room uh, and take time to visit with the Hendrickson, Cheever, and Garsantos families. Uh, I'm sure all three families uh, would love to get caught up with uh, their friends and colleagues. Finally, thank all of you uh, for coming here and being with us tonight. Uh, thank you for supporting the South Dakota State University College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Please drive safely.